uh, wildlife and uh, climate change. Today, we are going to look at uh, another topic uh, that is animals and birds. I, I, it is actually a continuation of uh, the biodiversity and climate change. Animals and birds and insects affected by climate change. In the last uh, couple of classes, we have been looking at uh, biodiversity in general and how it is going to affect the functioning of the biodiversity. And in general, we were also looking at uh, what is going to happen to all these animals and plants and other insects and birds and reptiles and amphibians and everything. That is good. It was a general one. So in this particular class, I am going to uh, focus on uh, animals and birds and insects affected by climate change, where uh, uh, some studies are available. Uh, because uh, you should know that uh, with regard to biodiversity, not many studies have been made with regard to climate change. The uh, general thing is that uh, we work on models and that is how we assume that such and such a thing is going to happen to the, uh, the animals or uh, plants or whatever it is. And then we are trying to conclude in that. But uh, uh, there are many studies also which have been made in the past which uh, gives some clear indication as to what is going to happen to many of these organisms. So we are look, going to look at them. Now, how vulnerable are the animals and birds to climate change? It is uh, likely that around half the threatened mammals out of 873 species and 23% of threatened birds out of 1,272 species have already responded negatively to climate change. This is actually based on a study by the Queensland University in Australia. Uh, so they have, uh, during their uh, detailed project work, they have uh, uh, come to this kind of a conclusion. Now, let us, uh, when we go into this particular topic, let us uh, look at uh, two terms which are very important here. And one is vulnerability. The vulnerab vulnerability of an organism to climate change. Now, what is vulnerability? It is defined as the degree to which a system or part of it may react adversely during the occurrence of a hazardous event. Now, uh, you, I mean, it is simple, simple to uh, understand this one. Uh, are we vulnerable or not? Say, we can say that the people in the coastal area of India are vulnerable to floods. Eh? They, they, that is, uh, if the flood is going to come, they may react adversely during the occurrence of that hazardous event. So this is, uh, I mean, we are very much vulnerable to climate change. We are very much vulnerable to a drought. We are very much vulnerable to a, an earthquake or any such uh, natural calamities. The humans and the animals and everything is vulnerable. But this vulnerability has some got some degree also. So that is, uh, we will see that. Now, second term we have to know, understand is uh, uh, resilience what is resilience the, it is the ability of a system of systems to absorb and recover from the impact of disruptive events without fundamental changes in function or structure you should understand this clearly ability of systems to absorb and recover from the impact of disruptive events now if such a adverse event is going to happen are they able to absorb and recover from that? We have seen that uh, we have got some kind of a resilience uh, as human beings. We have got a lot of resilience, you know, because we have got uh, scientific methods and technological advancement, which builds up resilience to us. At the same time, for example, now we are having the spread of COVID. 
Now, in a couple of months or three, we are expecting that a vaccine is going to be introduced into all the countries, and uh, we are going to build up a resilience to COVID, isn't it? So this is uh, the ability of the system to absorb and recover. Uh, we have to recover from it, from say, a disruptive event. So this is uh, resilient. So these two terms are very important when we deal with uh, the biodiversity and climate change. I'm sure uh, you would have heard, I don't know if you have heard, you know, I, I am I'm not able to get the response of everyone about a red list data book, which is maintained by an organization called IUCN. Huh? You, you see that IUCN, that is International Union for Conservation of Nature. That is uh, an uh, international organization which has got its uh, uh, spam in uh, branches all over the world and uh, you find that uh, offices are there for IUCN in different parts of the world and uh, they maintain a red data book or a red list it is called. Now what is this red list? It is nothing but the list of organisms plants or animals or even microorganisms, fungus, all these things, mushrooms, all these things, which have, which are facing some kind of threat from climate change or any other eventuality. Uh, maybe even human interference, you know, because we are engrossing some of the forest areas or we are destroying some of them, shooting down some of the animals. Now, whether they, they, I mean, what is the status of that particular animal or plant? So they are maintaining such a red list and this is being revised every year. So now the, the, the important thing that uh, you have to know in this particular red list is that there are seven levels of conservation for them. Now, this is most widely accepted uh, thing, you know, when, when it comes to conservation of nature. Now, those, uh, the first one is least concern. Say, for example, uh, we have uh, got many organisms in, I mean, in the forest, for example. There are a type of, uh, say, for example, a rabbit. Uh, uh, the rabbit is actually almost in the level of a pest. So, least concern for about, the, about those animals. Okay. Then, near threatened that is the next stage some kind of threat is there for their existence so that's a, such a classification is there then third category is the vulnerable they are very vulnerable to some kind of attack by human beings or uh, nature or something like that then next comes endangered eh? then it is it becomes very serious vulnerability is less than endangered okay endangered it becomes very serious that critically endangered that means that the population would have reduced a lot so that it is very critical number of that individual is there so they are critically endangered then extinct in the wild totally disappeared that category also is there. There are animals which have gone into that category and finally extinct in the wild. That is, in the, uh, in, uh, there are animals and birds and things like that, which uh, people are, have brought out of the wild and they are domesticating it. But at the same time, in a wild population, they don't exist anymore. So that is very, very, very serious problem. And finally, those which are totally extinct. That is not in the wild, not in the domesticated category, anything. It is totally disappeared from the surface of this earth. So I hope you understand these seven categories which are actually used by the red list to classify the animals. Animals, birds, everything, all organisms. Now let us uh, look into some of these uh, animals which have been studied reasonably well and uh, we have got some data said so this is polar bear and uh, you are you must have read in several articles about polar bear how threatened they are because of the uh, ice is being uh, melt in the from that uh, both the poles of the earth 
so they don't have enough snow or cold or anything like that that is ursus maritimus uh, vulnerability so this is first is saying the vulnerability habitat specialists rely almost entirely on the sea ice environment so vulnerability is this they are habitat specialists habitat specialist means that they can live only in a very specialized habitat which is nothing but sea ice environment that is in the polar area both in the arctic and the antarctic area where ice and snow are there almost 365 days there only they can survive now what is the resilience opportunistic eaters prefer seals but will feed on whale carcasses and even hunt walrus and beluga will prey on land animals when necessary but to some extent they have got some resilience that way their eating habits is not they are not very specialized eating they they they, they don't have any specialization they can eat several things prefer seals okay they prefer the seals but will feed on whale carcasses and even hunt walrus and beluga so if seals are not available they can hunt on other things so with regard to food they are not very specialized so that is a part of their resilience and what is the IUCN red list status they are coming into the vulnerable category they are not endangered they are still vulnerable I hope you understand this is how you uh, get into each of this one huh? and uh, uh, but uh, but you should know that the vulnerable why they have become vulnerable because the polar ice is melting and there is going to come a stage when we won't have polar ex polar ice caps at least for part of the year maybe by end of this century so at that time we do not know how far they, they from the vulnerable category, whether they are going to become into the endangered or critically endangered category. This is the same. Now, this is snow leopard, eh? Panthera uncia. The vulnerability is susceptible to indirect impacts of climate change, such as habitat encroachment by humans as a result of changing conditions in the region. Now, susceptible to indirect impacts of climate change, such as habitat encroachment. This is again, uh, when, uh, the, uh, this animal is again found in the snow covered areas. But when people are going to encroach this area, then there is a vulnerability. Now, resilience, high mobility across their large mountainous range not bound to a narrow altitude or region. So they have a very wide foraging area in the sense that they can go and hunt in different places. If one is one, one place is occupied by humans, if there is an encroachment, they can move to another place and then they can uh, survive. So that kind of a resilience is there for this animal. And the IUCN status, it is certainly an endangered category so you should know that in the pre when you compare it with the previous one that is the the snow leopard with the polar bear polar bear is in a better state when compared to snow leopard understand so because they, i mean the endangered category they become into endangered category not only because of the climate change but because of their their numbers may be also dwindling this is another problem, you know, due to some or other reasons. So that is why they are in the endangered category. Now, this is giant panda. That is Iluropoda melanoleuca. That is vulnerability is like feed almost exclusively on bamboo plants. This is their problem. Eh? They are, they, they, so they are very vulnerable in the sense that if bamboo plants are not there, mm -hmm. they lose their feed. Understand? So resilience is 
they can tolerate a fairly wide range of temperatures but at the same time they can tolerate wide range of temperatures so possibly if they are able to move they can go to other places bamboos are available but are you seeing red list category they are very endangered category okay now our tiger uh, and there are tigris uh, you know a lot about the tiger i am sure that uh, vulnerability is very small population size thought to be as few as 3200 individuals only this is their problem eh? the, the overall population that is all not only in india or all over the globe their total population is supposed to be only 3200 and what is their resilience live across a vast range of habitats from coastal bangladesh to frigid russian far east so they live in a lot of different and um, habitats you know that you have got it in Wayanad. uh when you know that uh, they, they require a kind of a, almost five square kilometers of land for their foraging you know and when that is not available or a, a competitor comes for them another tiger comes in then he will move into another one and sometimes you see that this movement has been to the farm area and there was an incident that uh, one, the forest department had to shoot one tiger in Wayanad a few years ago so this is there you know and uh, so they, they have got a resilience of moving if the but uh, that moving that is uh, of course uh, if forest area is available otherwise that the resilience is lost now are you seeing rest, rest list category that is they are endangered huh? not only vulnerable they are endangered because as you know their population is actually falling down that is what it is said Now we come to an insect, monarch butterfly. I'm sure you would have all seen. This is a common butterfly that you see around here and very common in our forest areas. If you go into Silent Valley and all these places, you will find plenty of them in big colonies. You know, I have seen them in Silent Valley uh, and even in Nilambur, uh, the forest areas, I have seen a lot of them. Uh, the Naus plexippus. The vulnerability, it is heavily dependent on environmental cues for reproduction migration and hibernation now what is this environmental cues a suitable environment say for example now you see very few butterflies in kerala what is the reason actually this is a season when you should have found a lot of butterflies in kerala the reason is that we have got an unseasonal rain because of the low pressure going in the Bay of Bengal, almost last one and a half months we have been experiencing unseasonal rain. Otherwise, the southwest monsoon should stop uh, almost by mid-August. Instead of that, even after mid-August, we are having heavy rains. Record, record high rains, you know, is going into even 200 millimeters a day in several places in Kerala. Now, this is not a suitable condition for any type of butterfly, not only the monarch. So they need a, a, a suitable environment for reproduction, migration, and hibernation. You know all those processes. Resilience, have a short lifespan and fast reproductive rate, which could aid adaptation to changes in the environment. Of course, they have a, not like other animals, you know, these butterflies have a very short life and uh, naturally they can, uh, if uh, their eggs are remaining somewhere or other, they can have a fast reproductive rate, which could aid in adaptation to changes in the environment. Now, are you seeing category, let us see, while monarch themselves are in considered an endangered species, IUCN recognizes their migration as an endangered phenomenon. You see how IUCN is uh, looking at it. Not only the organism, 
but its behavior also whether there is an endangerment uh, their migration is considered as an endangered phenomenon see they cannot migrate from one to other place if there is a climate change this is the thing so that is how the whole thing become endangered so they if the if the suppose this if uh, these butterflies cannot migrate from one to other place then naturally there is going to be an endangerment to their life or to their existence now we come into <coughs> The green sea turtle, a yeah, very special type of turtle, Kelonia maidas, vulnerability. It is very sensitive to temperature changes at all life stages. Yeah, it's very sensitive. So climate change, it is difficult for it to withstand. For example, the sex of baby turtles is determined by the temperature of the sand the eggs are laid in. See, if there is going to be a higher temperature, then the sex is going to be males. And if the lower temperature, the same it is more females. Now you get a population, suppose you get a population of only males due to a temperature increase. What will hap happen to the generations of this particular turtle? Naturally, it cannot reproduce further because no females. Yeah? So naturally, they will perish. So, resilience, high amounts of genetic diversity within the species, which increases their chance of adapting to changing environmental conditions. So, they have a high genetic uh, variability within their uh, species, which increases their chance to adapt. So, the genetic variability is there. And so, naturally, they have got some kind of uh, an adaptation. Are you seeing category? It is endangered it's an endangered turtle okay you should know that now this is the african elephant eh? loxodonda africana now, you know that it is not our the our asian elephant the asian elephant is different you can see the ears are very different you know they so large ears and spreading to the side like this you know so that is a speciality with the African elephant and they look uh, more, uh, 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 I mean, terrifying than compared to the Asian elephant, to me at least, you know, I don't know what about you. Uh, vulnerability, need 40 to 80 gallons of fresh water a day just for drinking. You know that uh, an elephant, uh, a mature elephant weighs around uh, 6 to 10 tons. Huh? Most of the elephants, they weigh from 6 to 10 tons and they require 40 to 80 gallons of fresh water. One gallon is around the three and a half liters, you know. So you can calculate how many liters of water they need. Suppose there is going to be a drought in their uh, habitat, then naturally they are in big danger. Now, resilience live in an incredible range of habitats from open savannas to dense tropical forests. You know, the African elephants also come to the, uh, come to attack the farmlands in Africa, not only in Asia, see? So they, they, they have got a wide range of, uh, uh, incredible range of habitats. They come, when, when they want water, they come to the farmlands and they try to take the water. So this is very usual. Now, are you seeing in category? It is vulnerable. Okay, because uh, one of the big problems is that uh, uh, with the African elephants, there is since uh, the forest laws are uh, are not as strict as it is in uh, uh, Asian countries where we have the elephants. There is a lot of hunting of the elephants for its tusk and the nails and uh, all these things, you know, and the bones and, and uh, the teeth. All these things, you know, there is a lot of hunting of this elephant there. that is uh, making it uh, vulnerable. Now, Asian elephant is also some kind of uh, the, uh, it is an endangered animal now. It is Elaphus maximus. And uh, the vulnerability, it is, it prefer to eat 
native grasses and other local plants that invasive species are beating out. So what is the food of the elephant? It is eating native grasses and other local plants that invasive species are beating out. What are these invasive species? Huh? You know, you know, maybe you know about some animals, but there are many plants which are weeds in the forest. Huh? Say, for example, uh, a mile a minute weed. And uh, there are so many other weeds, you know. Uh, which are growing in the forest and covering the entire forest area with weed, which is not their food actually. So if bamboos are going to be covered by that, or the grasses are going to be covered by some kind of weeds, they lose their food. So this is their ma main vulnerability that they are experiencing. So the climate change is leading to a lot of invasive species, you should know. Many new uh, weeds are coming to our country and to, from our country to other countries. So this spread of these weeds or invasive species, they are called, is a big danger to many animals because they are losing their food because of that. Now, what is the resilience? Live in a wide variety of habitats and across a broad range of altitudes. We know in Kerala very well, and uh, even in Karnataka, people know that uh, it is very well. But they always come to the farmlands where the people are cultivating the material, you know. So when they do when they do not have food in the forest, they come to the open, to the farms, and they try to attack the bananas, they attack the coconuts, and all kinds of uh, crops which are, uh, they are uh, eating away and destroying many of them in that process. And so this is a big uh, uh, man-animal conflict, which is happening nowadays in all over Kerala and all over India. Because the farmers are now complaining that many of these have uh, the, they are increase in number and uh, we are not able to do any farming because of them. So this is a very serious problem that the government will have to face in the near future. Now, are you seeing red, cat, uh, red list category? It is an endangered species, although it is attacking and coming, maybe because they have got the number reduction is there so the forest uh, forest is uh, the forest area is coming down and they have they, they are losing many food items are not there so this is the problem they they like native grasses and they like bamboos so when they are not there naturally their food habit i mean uh, the, the the place where they are looking for the food is lost this is the problem now, another one is the gorilla. Gorilla, Beringai, Beringai. Now, what is the vulnerability? It is combined, confined to a very small range surrounded by human settlements, so they can't move elsewhere. So, in places where they are there, they are confined to very small range surrounded by human settlements this particular species of gorilla. So, resilience, not picky eaters, feed on everything from fruit to flowers to tree bark. They feed on everything. So, they have got a good resilience. That's the thing. <coughs> Excuse me. Now, this is cheetah. Asino, Asinonyx jubatus. Now, what is the vulnerability of this species? Very low genetic diversity within the species could hinder ability to adapt to changing environmental conditions. The genetic diversity of this particular species is very limited. So, adapting to a newer environmental condition is very difficult for it. This is the main problem with the cheetah. Now, what is the resilience? Incredibly low freshwater requirements. Need a drink only every three to four days. So this is a uh, plus point for them. They need water only three or once in three to four days. That is their advantage. 
Now, red list, they are vulnerable. Uh, very ter terrifying and uh, ter terror looking animal, isn't it? Uh, the Indiana bat. It is not the Indian bat, it is the Indiana bat. Uh, Myotis sodalis. What is it? Are perishing because of white nose syndrome. A lethal disease caused by an imported European fungus, which is common in their migration locations in the, in the north and eastern parts of the US. 72% of their population has perished since 2006. So you must be wondering why it is uh, climate change. The reason is that this an imported European fungus a fungus has come from Europe into America, which is actually killing this one. Now, this fungal growth in you in the US may be due to a change to climate. It is promoting that. So uh, before that, it was not seen in the perishing of this particular bat. Now they are perishing because of this fungus. Seventy-two percent of the population has perished. So it is again a an endangered species. The list category is not mentioned in this case. Now, this is another one, which is again a vulnerable animal, a very interesting animal. Uh, uh, the snowshoe hare, uh, that is Lepus americanus, it is again in America, is a small logomorph, well adapted to seasonally snowy environments capable of seasonally changing its pelage from mostly brown to white. Now, what is the speciality with this particular hair, you know? They are usually brown in color, but this is depending upon the surrounding. Now, when the snow is there, they change their color to white. It's the same animal becoming white. It is not snow which is deposited on the hair of this animal. No, it is they just changed its color. It's a kind of camouflage. But it is not like our chameleon. Chameleon can change it at will. Huh? When it is uh, going into a particular uh, surface, depending upon the color of the surface, it can change the color. But this hair is not that. It has got a disadvantage. You read this. But both initiation dates of color change and the rate of the fall, brown to white mold are fixed. They have got a fixed date of changing the color. It is not based, even if the snow is not falling of a, on a particular year, the hair will change into this particular color. Understand? So it is a, it is a very helpless um, thing, you know. I mean, in the sense that actually nature has given that capacity to change the color, mainly to have, make it a camouflage. That is, uh, to pre getting attack from other animals during the snowy season and the other season, they have got that kind of a camouflage because they are very harmless creatures, you know. They are very uh, quiet creatures, I mean, but they run very fast. That is one uh, plus point with them. So, uh, uh, but uh, so when in in case of a climate change, what is uh, going to happen? What is predicted is that the snowfall is going to be less, or even if the snowfall occurs, the snow is going to melt very quickly. So at that time, this white hair is very visible to preying animals. So their population is going to dwindle based on that. Okay. The pickup, Ocotona princeps, is a small logomorph that often inhabits alpine areas in the western US. Pickas appear dependent both on moist and cool summer conditions and winter snow. Acute temperature stresses and vegetation productivity may be all playing a role in pica declines. So it often inhabits the alpine areas, that is very snowy area in the western US, and depend both on moist and cool summer conditions and winter snow. 
it is a it's a it prefers the cold climate hot and cold yeah not very hot temperature stresses and vegetation productivity may all be playing a role in picard declines so in case of a climate change when we are expecting higher temperatures naturally such an animal will need to migrate to colder regions otherwise they are just becoming an endangered species now how do you manage climate vulnerability maintain and if possible improve landscape connectivity that is one array i mean one approach maintain and if possible improve landscape connectivity what is this landscape connectivity for example you must be knowing that in kerala there was a recent incident uh, when we travel from Trishur to Palghat, you meet in a place, you have a place called Kudiran. In Kudiran, the highway, National Highway Authority is constructing two tunnels. Understand? Two tunnels. One for going in and one for coming out. So two tunnels are there for going to Palghat. Now there it is, the construction is almost completed. Now, instead of a tunnel, what they could have done, they could have really uh, excavated the entire area with the excavators and then made the highway like the, I mean, as an ordinary highway. But instead, they constructed a tunnel. What was the reason for it, you know? The reason is that you have a forest area there. So if you are going to have a very wide highway, this is six lane highway then a lot of the forest will have to be destroyed. Which means that the elephants and other creatures and other, other organisms which are actually traveling across that area cannot go from, I mean, both sides you have the forest. So from one side, if they have to go to the other side, they have a lot of problem. Because they could be hit by vehicles and vehicles could meet with accidents. So they are resorted to a tunnel. You find a very opposite situation uh, when you go from Palga to Coimbatore, you reach Walayar. In Walayar, it is very common to have accidents where elephants are hit by moving trains and deer is hit by a lot of vehicles and so many other smaller animals, of course, die because of the vehicles. Because the highway is constructed right through the center of the forest both sides you have the forest and the animals are unable to cross. So that is one connectivity maintenance. Reduce stresses on current populations and habitats. And we will take up these things a bit later also. As much as possible, reduce the stresses on current population and habitats. Don't allow any encroachments and give maximum protection to the forest or the habitat area. Maintain or improve current habitat for specific species. If you identify a specific species, improve that. For example, many people are now suggesting that these elephants are all coming out of the forest and coming into the farmland and creating a lot of problem for the people. Why not create much uh, more food in the forest itself for the elephants so that they don't come out? They should have enough water in the forest and enough food also in the forest. So they won't prefer to come to the farmland because they don't like to be attacked by human beings, you know. Manage to maintain landscape diversity. Landscape diversity. What is landscape? Landscape is like actually a unit of several ecosystems. So diverse ecosystem should be there in the landscape so that they can have food at one or the other place. This is the thing. Monitor change. We have to monitor the population and see what is the change happening to the population. This is being done in India very much, I think. Now, we come to some of the birds. Now, the common moray in North America has advanced its breeding date 24 days per decade. What is it actually? advancing egg laying breeding nesting etc yesterday i was telling about uh, advancing of the flowering uh, now in this particular case 
uh, a bird is given as an example, it is advancing its egg laying. Much before it should be laying egg, it is laying egg. This is the thing that is happening. This is the common murray in North America. It is so uh, 24 days per decade it is getting advanced now because of the climate change. That is what is happening now. Now, this is a repetition of a slide in the same one which I showed you that uh, two birds, Apis, Apis and Herundo rustica. You can see the migration. The migration days, the number of days it is spending in the migration areas is getting reduced from 230. One of them is reducing it to 180 and the other one is reducing it to 140 days so this is a clear indication that uh, they are not they are not able i mean they, they, they the climate is not suitable for them to rest there now migration times are shifting for many such birds this is the fact a study of 63 years of data for 96 species of bird migrants in Canada showed that 27 species have altered their arrival dates. Eh? Arrival dates have been altered significantly with most arriving earlier and some delaying departure. Most arriving earlier. So, you know, we have studied that the impact of climate change is that increase in temperature. And uh, when they uh, say, when we should be starting the uh, uh, the, the this uh, the, uh, spring around uh, March or April, we will be starting it much before in February itself. So they they are altering their arrival date significantly, and then they stay back throughout the spring, and uh, maybe by by July, instead of the leaving that area by July, they some of some of them are leaving by August or September. So extended days of uh, staying at particular place. So the migration pattern is all shifting, and uh, this is very threatening also because their food availability of the food is also important. Depending upon the climate and the environment, the food availability is also changing. So this is happening to many bird sanctuaries all over the world. Now, bird behavior and their environment are becoming mismatched. What is this mismatching? For example, wood warblers in North America are in migrating earlier from their neotropical wintering grounds, despite earlier springs in their northern breeding ranges. Say, they should be migrating earlier. Instead of that, they are not migrating earlier. And uh, uh, neotropical wintering grounds, eh? they are actually going ahead because the winter is also almost like the spring because of the increase in temperature. And uh, earlier springs in their northern breeding. So when they try to migrate to the other one, if they're long distance, when they reach there, you will find they will find that their the climate is not very suitable for them so many will die during that process this is the problem and they may not get the right kind of food they want during that season so mismatching of the whole thing or the whole pattern of migration is changing and these poor birds are finding it difficult now distributions are changing a study of 35 North American warbler species found that the range of occurrence of seven of the species has shifted significantly north in the past 24 years by an average of 65 miles. None of the birds shifted to the south. Very typical example of migrating to more cooler areas. You see how many bird species 24 years by an average of 65 miles, they have shifted their population. Huh? That is seven species out of 35. 
So this is happening. Some of them cannot survive this uh, hot weather. And so they are the birds. You see, the birds are greatly advantaged. They can fly anytime, and then uh, they will go. You know, even during the COVID time, we cannot fly during the COVID time, but birds can fly. That is their great uh, advantage. You know. Okay, ecological communities are getting disrupted. Uh, ecological community only eight percent of cassin socklets they are another type of water birds nesting on triangle island were successful eight percent only successful this is because late northerly winds delayed coastal upwelling which affected plankton growth and caused a decline in the fish species on which the seabirds depend uh, what is this whole process? It is, of course, very, uh, you may not be able to understand it very carefully without an explanation. The, what is the reason uh, the, the nesting was not successful? Because do, if, a, if a bird, if a migratory bird is nest, doing nesting also, it means that it is going to breed there in that new place. Okay, but only 8% was successful. Why? Late northerly winds delayed coastal upwelling. What is this coastal upwelling? Actually, the in an ocean, the upper layers of water are warm compared to the lower layers. And due to some kind of processes in the ocean, there is this cold water will come to the top. And that is a kind that is called the upwelling. So all the mud and other materials which are below will also come along with the water. So it is a lot of bubbling at the top surface, very heavy type of bu bubbling. And uh, along with that, there will be a lot of new food being exposed. The fish will come to feed on that. Understand? Then the birds can catch that fish. But if there is no upwelling occurs because of the climate change, then naturally they are not getting that food. In Kerala, we have got a very typical example of this. Nowadays, fishermen are complaining that they are not having the beach areas. There are many places in the beach areas in Kerala where, I mean, all over India it is happening, not in Kerala. I mean, I do not know the any other, uh, the uh, any English word for chagra or anything. It is actually the result of upwelling. Upwelling in the ocean is like, can happen right in the mid of the ocean or in the coastal areas also. So what happens is that when upwelling is there, a lot of fish population is increasing and some of this fish population is washed to the store by the sea waves. And that is why we get the chagra. We also get the food like that, you know, and a lot of birds actually feed on that, you know, you know, when the chagara is there, a lot of birds will also come to feed on things. So this is one such bird, you know, which is really feeling bad because there are no chagaras. Extinction risks are on the rise. Many birds are getting extinct. Huh? Canadian ivory gulls have already declined in number by 90% over the past two decades 90 percent decline you know extinction birds most at risk of extinction from climate change are those with restricted ranges poor ability to move their range small populations or those already facing conservation challenges so when they have some such handicaps there is a very good chance that with the, uh, they, i mean when there is a climate change they become extinct now conclusions, climate change is now affecting bird species behavior, ranges and population dynamics. Some bird species are already experiencing negative impacts. In the future, climate change will put large number of birds at risk of extinction. So you know that although they are in the sky, they can migrate, but still they are also not saved from climate change. They have to perch somewhere. 
they have to take their food they have to have an ideal temperature so if there are none of these things are existing then many are going to become extinct or perish now another thing that is coral bleaching i was telling you <clears throat> coral bleaching in acropora coral in the great barrier reef i don't know if you have gone to the great barrier reef i have been there and uh, I have seen this uh, beautiful area, the Great Barrier Reef, with the uh, beautiful corals. The coral in the background is the normal one with the algae on surface. That is this coral, which is almost uh, grey in colour. That is the natural one. And most of the corals will look like this only. They have got the beautiful shapes and different colours, of course. Not only always grey. You know? This is due to ocean acidification and warming. Now you may be finding, you may be saying that this coral looks more beautiful. <laughs> Actually, it is not. It is not uh, healthy. It is the ocean got acidified because of CO2 dissolution in the water, so that the carbonic acid is there. And naturally, this coral has been affected side by side. Another coral is there. It has not been affected. Maybe this is more vulnerable species here, and which has got affected. So in the course of time. When this calcification of the coral is lost, it becomes very vulnerable to many diseases and corals are really perishing. In, this is a big problem in the Great Barrier Reef, which has got the biggest stock of the corals. This is, uh, I showed you this slide yesterday, I think. First appearance of an insect, Lepinotarsa, in the Mediterranean region. You see the first appearance has been delayed. And one fortieth day of the year to one hundred, almost one hundred and tenth day of the year by a month, this has been delayed. I mean, this has been advanced. Okay, thank you. And I think uh, I have uh, uh, explained to you some of the organisms and uh, both the uh, birds, insects, mammals. Uh, almost uh, several several animals which are in the endangered or vulnerable list of the IUCN and this is how we make studies on these animals say when somebody says that this particular animal is endangered you should see that it is actually a category which has been mentioned by the IUCN of course we can the national um, register can be also made depending upon the studies and all that which uh, they have to report to IUCN and IUCN will take a decision on that. <coughs> These are all there. So if you would like to uh, ask uh, any question, then uh, I will be able to answer it.